Well, good evening, ladies and gentlemen, and welcome to the West Sussex Record Office. We, uh, we will make a start. Um, as many of you know, on a Tuesday evening at the end of the month, uh, we would usually be having our Tuesday evening talks. Uh, sadly, because we haven't been able to do that for the last year and a half, we decided to put together a series of remote Tuesday talks. So this is the first uh, of uh, a series that will be running through until November. And as before, it will be seven o'clock on the last Tuesday of the month. And I'll tell you a bit more about what's coming up uh, at the end of, of this episode. Um, but I've been asked to, to, to get the ball rolling, as it were, and to, to start the series. And what I'd like to do with you tonight is, is to take you through uh, some of the treasures of the West Sussex Record Office. Uh, some of them might be familiar to some of you, others may not be. Uh, but I want to take you through um, a few documents and really the stories behind them um, and uh, the extraordinary things that, that we've been able to find out about them. So we'll, we'll go through to the... It's not clicking down for some reason. Oh, here we go. Let's go. That's it. Um, just a few introductory slides about uh, who we are and what we do for those of you who are joining us and uh, perhaps for the first time uh, or haven't been to see us in a while. The West Sussex Record Office was set up in 1946 and uh, a few years ago we celebrated our 70th anniversary and I'm aware that this year actually is our 75th, but obviously with the pandemic and the closure and so forth, we haven't been able to celebrate in the way that we would like to. We are an accredited archive service, uh, which means we are accredited by the National Archives and licensed to hold public records. So it means we have to meet certain standards uh, and to provide um, a, an excellent level of service, which we try to do. We also run a records management service for the County Council um, and that was set up in 1969. We moved into our present accommodation uh, in Orchard Street uh, in Chichester in 1989. And the building that we're in now is uh, a purpose-built archive centre that was built to the, the then British archive standard, BS 5454. Um, and there we undertake preservation, cataloguing, digitisation and public access of the archives. And the archives themselves um, date back over 1,200 years. And I'm conscious when I look at this first slide that it's very much um, pre-pandemic uh, with lots of people, in fact, attending one of our Tuesday talks there in the bottom right-hand corner. And I hope very much we'll be able to, to get back to that before too long. Our oldest document is a, a, a charter that is part of the Chichester Cathedral Archives, and you can see that top right. It's a, a 780 charter, uh, the OSLAC charter. Our archives are held in five strong rooms and we have eight miles of shelving. And these are environmentally controlled so that we maintain the correct temperature and humidity 24-7 um, throughout the year and that they're in the correct conditions for their long-term preservation. And we continue to get archives in uh, and we have about 300 accessions coming in every year. Not quite so many this year, but we have still been getting them. Our archive collections um, are many and varied. Um, we hold the estate and family archives uh, of uh, some of the great estates in West Sussex. Uh, we hold the cathedral and diocesan records and we are the diocesan record office. We also hold the uh, Royal Sussex Regimental Archive and we hold the archive of local authorities, organizations, uh, societies, businesses, churches, schools, hospitals, police and um, courts. Uh, so we have such a wide variety of records that it's actually quite difficult to select out a, a few favourites to show you tonight. Um, the format that they come in varies considerably, as does as do the size, really, of the, of the collections. So it can be paper and parchment, um, books, maps, plans, photographs, prints, um, drawings, oral histories, and films. 
And the although the strong rooms hold all of the, the hard copy archives, as it were, we're, we're also starting to take in digital archives and modern media. And uh, we have our co-location partners with us in the record office, uh, and that's Screen Archive Southeast. And you can see Ina, the archivist there, looking through one of the films. I will just say a bit about digital archives, although the, my main my main thrust this, this evening is to talk about is to talk about the the uh, hard copy archives. But as I said, we're increasingly taking in um, born digital archives and records, and some of those are, as I say, born digital. That's how they were created, and that's how they come into us. We also um, take what we call surrogate copies, and we digitise um, the original archives for access for exhibitions and so forth. So we have a huge amount of digital content. Um, and at the start of the pandemic in March last year, we had received 173 gigabytes um, of born digital holdings. And we had over 177 and a half thousand um, surrogate images. So a huge amount of, of digital material and that comes with its own challenges, I think, both in terms of how we store it and how we keep it safe in the longer term and how we can continue to access it. And so we're using something called Preservica uh, as a, a, a software platform, an online platform that enables us to, uh, to ingest those archives, to keep them safe, uh, to migrate them to the next format and to continue to make them accessible. So that's a very much a new initiative for us at the moment. Um, and it's, I think, important to bear that in mind as the, the next big challenge, I think, as we as we as we head into the into the 21st century, we have archives going back 1200 years and we know how to look after paper and parchment. Digital is something very different again. Who uses the archives? Well, pre pandemic, we had over six and a half thousand visitors a year. People would look at our online catalogue to find out what we had. Um, they would come into the search room. They could be family and local historians, military historians, school groups, students, uh, academics, archaeologists and landscape historians come in to use our, our maps in particular. Um, people who are carrying out legal and planning inquiries, business inquiries, and indeed our archives are used for public inquiries as well. We have authors and artists coming in to do their research or seek inspiration. We have individual researchers and then we have community groups who like, would, look, would like to engage with the archives and find out more about their locality and the places that they live. We also have a, uh, a large body of volunteers um, who help us with our work and we deliver a series of talks and programs and exhibitions uh, on site and we very much hope to be able to get back to that in due course. I think archives really are the, the collective memory um, that, that we all hold dear. And it is, it is by working, I think, with individual people, with partnerships and organizations, with local communities, that we can help to preserve those memories and preserve the heritage that, that they are part of. Uh, and the projects that we get involved in involve, uh, involve research, digitization, oral history work, um, and really discovering and recording community memories as, as part of that and making sure that that is part of the archives as well. And we're helped with that by the West Sussex Archive Society who are our friends organization. Uh, and they very much help and support us in our work. And they also help in raising funds to enable us to buy documents when they come up in the sale room. And what you can see on the screen there on the the left hand top left is in fact a, a group of our volunteers and many of them have been helping us throughout the pandemic by continuing to work on remote projects with us. And on the right hand side, you can see the West, members of the West Sussex Archive Society uh, and they are coming together to look at um, some of the archives that they've helped us to buy um, during, during uh, the year, the past years. And the boards below really are just a, a snapshot of some of the projects that we've been involved with. Here again are, are some reminders of some of those projects, some of the activities that we've been involved in, 
And I think the opportunities that, that we're very keen to take and that we enjoy, um, enjoy doing. Uh, Military Voices was an oral history project led by Martin Hayes, the County Lo Local Studies Librarian, who's now part of the, the Record Office team. And that was about recording the, uh, the memories and the voices of veterans uh, involved in conflicts and who served throughout this century, uh, the 20th century. Uh, and if you, if you go onto the Military Voices website, you can actually bring up some of those recordings. And they are extraordinarily powerful, I think, um, to listen to. Uh, we worked with the Guinea Pig Club and Queen Victoria Hospital in East Grinstead uh, and the East Grinstead Museum uh, to do a project funded by the Wellcome Trust to preserve the um, patient, hospital patient case files. There are about 15,000 of them. And of those, about 680 uh, were guinea pig files. And these were the Second World War airmen um, who... Uh, Mackendo, the renowned plastic surgeon, uh, worked with and treated during the Second World War, and he developed his pioneering um, treatment um, in, in, during that period. And it's, a, again, another powerful archive. And it, that, that, in fact, that archive will be the subject of our, one of our next Tuesday talks um, in September. Uh, we work with site support in Worthing on a journey in time, which was about exploring the history of visual impairment for people in Worthing. And that was a, a really interesting project to be involved with. We supported Bernstein in Chichester, which was celebrating the 100th the centenary of Leonard Bernstein's birth. Uh, and we were involved with many groups locally with that. Uh, and the Chichester Psalms, which were commissioned by Dean Walter Carsey, um, form um, part of the archive of the uh, of, of, the, um, of the cathedral. Uh, and the Chichester Psalms were in fact, a performance was put on in 2018 um, as part of that festival. And uh, Bernstein's son, Alexander came over for that performance and I was lucky enough to be there as well. And he came into the archive, into the archive um, just on the day of the performance, just before in the afternoon to have a look at the archives that we hold um, about his father's commission. And you can see him there in the bottom right corner. We've also been involved in the Baudry Art Therapy Archive project with Outside In, uh, again, a welcome funded project. Uh, and that was uh, an extraordinary project to be involved with, uh, an art therapy archive from the 50s, 60s and 70s um, that, uh, that had survived uh, and that we were able to digitize and preserve and work with a group of existing artists to help to interpret um, and to make accessible. And more latterly, we just finished a project with, with High Down Gardens and been um, helping with that. Uh, High Down Gardens is in just north of Worthing and um, the, the archives that we hold together with the archives that they held uh, were used to develop the new visitor center and to provide information and background on this really important garden. And these are some of the partners that we've been involved with over the last five to six years. There are many and varied. Um, if your name isn't on there, it doesn't mean that we haven't worked with you or that we don't want to work with you. It's just that there was no more room on the slide. So <laughs> I think it's a, it's, a, it's, a, it's a snapshot, I think, of some of the work that we've, that we've done or are doing. And now I want to come on to look at some of the archives themselves in a bit more detail. And I particularly like these two shots because it's a, a mixture of the old and new. So on the left, we have a garland photo from 1950. And this shows Fred Streeter in his study. Now he was um, a well-known British horticulturalist uh, and he was also a broadcaster. So he was, he presented a BBC gardening programme called Homegrown, which was a forerunner of um, Gardener's Question Time, really. Um, he was born in Pulborough. He spent much of his working life as the head gardener at um, Petworth House Gardens. Um, he became very well known. He was, he had a, uh, he had a programme devoted to him on Desert Island Discs. He's in DMB. Uh, but I particularly like this photo of him in his study looking through his records. 
And then contrasting that on the right-hand side with Nick, who's one of our present day archivists uh, in the library, which I'm broadcasting to you from tonight. Uh, and Nick is uh, busy at work on the Chichester Festival Theatre Archive. So what is in the archives? And if you go into our strong rooms, you'll see so many boxes and uh, that every box you can open up and every box will tell a story. And when we have school groups round, it's really interesting because they love going into the strong rooms and um, turning the handles on the mobile shelving uh, and um, opening up the box to see what they can find. So it's, a, it's an adventure, I think. And, and it is for all of us who work in archives. And where the archives come from is another story as well. Um, I've been an archivist for the best part of 40 years. Um, I've been into lofts and basements. Uh, I've been into sheds and outhouses. I've been into hay barns and stables, belfries and vestries, castle keeps, uh, shops and um, schools, hospital storerooms, and indeed into the odd skip or two as well. And it is always amazing where records come from and how they come to light. And they still do come to light. It isn't as though everything that is out there has already been found and has come into us. There is always more to be found. And um, we very much rely and on our supporters and friends and those who know us um, to, to tell us about these things or for people to come forward and ask for our help with their archives. So tonight, I would just want to pick out, I think, four of my favorites to share with you. And I'm going to start off with William Blake. Now for our 70th anniversary in, um, in 2016, we asked 70 different people to choose their favorite archives. We put them into a, into a book, into a publication. Uh, and then we had a series of blogs, which is still up on the website for you to, for you to read. And William Blake was the one that I chose. Um, and it's a, it is a really, I think a really interesting story. I think for generations, um, artists and writers have found their inspiration um, in the West Sussex landscape and indeed still do. We still get artists and writers coming in to look through the archives for that very reason. And sometimes details of their lives can be found in the most unexpected places. Now, William Blake lived in Feltham at the turn of the 19th century in 1800 to 1804 for a short period of time. And he came there to work on the engravings for William Haley's uh, Life of Cooper, and he published, which was published in Chichester in 1803 to four. While he was there, he became involved in an altercation with a soldier by the name of John Schofield at the Fox Inn in, on the 12th of August in 1803. And you can see on the screen there to the left, uh, his cottage uh, and to the right uh, is, a, is a picture of the Fox Inn. This led to him um, being indicted um, at the quarter sessions. And if I take you to the next slide, here we go. Um, this is a, an extract from the quarter sessions records. Um, I'm not sure whether on your screens you'll be able to make any of this out, uh, but he was actually accused of sedition against the king. And he was supposed to have shouted, um, damn the king and the soldiers are all slaves. And on the one, two, three, four, fifth line down, it's, it calls him a wicked, seditious and evil disposed person. So they effectively threw the book at him really. Um, and I think it would be interesting to think about how this might have played out in the Twitter sphere today. I think um, it would have been an, an interesting example. He um, was indicted at the Petworth Court Sessions in, in October 1803, and he stood trial in Chichester in January 1804, but he was acquitted. Uh, and one contemporary paper indeed wrote that the invented character of the evidence was so obvious that acquittal resulted. And Blake, unsurprisingly, uh, returned to London in 1804 after that. 
He is supposed to have got inspiration um, for his poem, Jerusalem, whilst he was in um, West Sussex. Um, and it is thought that he was inspired by for this one with his regular rides through from Feltham to, to uh, and Lavent between the two. Uh, whether that's true, I don't know, but it is a lovely story. Um, and amongst the, the archives, um, we have a lovely series of um, copies of some of Blake's work, uh, early copies. Um, and we have on the right there, the Songs of Innocence. And what I want to share with you here um, is the Songs of Experience. Um, now this was um, made in the 1880s by a gentleman called William Muir, this copy. And he was a, a granite agent by trade, um, but he was also a Blake scholar and enthusiast. And he wanted to try and make coloured facsimiles of Blake's originals available more widely. And he largely worked on copies that were then held at the British Museum. And he used methods that were very similar to Blake's. Um, he used a process, he made um, lithographs of the, the outlines of the artwork, and then he and his assistants printed them and then they colored them in by hand and the process became known as illuminated printing. Um, his main assistants were his sister, Hannah, and uh, Emily Druitt, who was herself an accomplished watercolorist. And she was the daughter of, of one of his colleagues in the, in the granite trade. Um, and altogether they produced um, copies of about 13 works, but in very limited editions. So very few of these survive. And until the Blake Trust began um, publishing facsimiles in the 1950s, these were the only copies, color copies that were available. So I'm going to show you, in fact, um, this one, if I can. There we go. Looking to take it through and see some of the, some of the contents. Um, you can see that they're very, very beautiful. Uh, and that the colors are, are indeed very vivid as well. And we finish up here with the tiger, um, which is well known to you all. And I particularly like um, the tiger at the bottom and the beautiful colors that, um, that are done it, that he's done in. Um, I don't, I'm hoping that you can see that, there we go. Um, and he certainly is um, a tiger, tiger burning bright, I think. And this came into us as part of the Cruikshank collection. Um, Arthur Chichester Cruikshank was the rector of Ditchling for many years. And he was also a, a, a Blake um, fan and enthusiast. Uh, and he built up a, a library um, of books around Blake and Haley and his circle. And when he died in 1958, his widow presented um, a large portion of his library to the record office, which is why we have these today. For my next choice, um, I'm taking you to the Western Front in 1915, courtesy of Ralph Ellis. Uh, many of you will be familiar with Ralph, Ralph Ellis. I think his memoirs are, are absolutely stunning and one of the, the real jewels in, in our collections. Uh, he was an artist and an ensign painter uh, who lived at Arundel. And he served on the Western Front with the 7th Battalion of the Royal Sussex Regiment. Uh, he enlisted in August 1914, and he enlisted into the ranks, uh, and he, he remained in the ranks before he was promoted to sergeant at a later date. And his memoir is in five volumes, and they really... Um, take you through the experiences of a soldier in the ranks at that time on the Western Front. Because he was an artist uh, and, a, and a writer, um, the, the narrative is, is compelling and the sketches and the watercolors that accompany them are, are really beautiful. Um, he, his, if I take you to, there we go, you can see some of them there. Um, the top right-hand corner is, is the second volume of his, of his memoirs. They, uh, as I say, they, they were originally written in, in five volumes. Um, he didn't 
obviously do it while he was at the front. Um, he he can he wrote the first while he was on leave in 1916. So some of this would have been from from memory. Um, and he continued to write um, during the 15 months that he spent in hospitals in 1917 and 1918 when he was invalided out. And he completed his fifth volume in 1921. But you can see there that combination of the, the wonderful text um, and the uh, illustrations that, that he produced as part of that. And if I can get the technology to work, <laughs> I'm going to show you inside one of his one of his volumes. Now, this is the uh, the second volume, and it was uh, it, it it it's the account of um, the seventh battalion of the Royal Sussex uh, and Ralph Ellis when he was in northern France, close to the Belgian border, uh, between June and September 1915. And it starts with uh, the little border house there. And I'll read the text out as we go through. The little border house by the ridge, connecting France to Belgium. This house is so like a million other homes where a screaming shell has brought the horror, the horror of hell to itself to those who lived there. No imagination is needed to see what happened as one peers through the splintered door, the needlework thrown aside the money box smashed, everything else of their little world left in great haste, lest the next shell bring an even greater hell. And here you can see inside, through the splintered door, as he describes it. And then he has a, a series of illustrations of the dugout. And he says that, that dugouts, when obtainable, are incidentally for tired men to get into on every possible occasion and sleep, but a home for every creeping thing the earth breeds. Our specialities here were chats, and by chats he means lice, and mice. The chats ate you and the mice ate your rations. And you, if you were of a worrying nature, there was always the possibility of a Bosch mine lifting beneath your dugout. Apart from these petty annoyances, one did enjoy little social gatherings, inviting pals round to feed when a fat parcel arrived, that mice at least had to be defeated. And these five volumes were donated to the office by um, the late daughter of Ralph Ellis, by Margaret. We have published these as a facsimile volume um, with the Sussex Record Society. And if you go onto the Sussex Record Society website, you will be able to see details of how to purchase the volume if you wish to. But also there is a gallery of images from this publication. Sadly, Margaret died before um, this was finally published, but uh, Sue Hepburn, who um, produced this volume and, and who's the editor, and I did go to see her and she very kindly um, provided information and um, material from her own book on her father that um, is, we were able to use um, as part of this volume. So from the Western Front to Worthing, uh, and from Worthing to, to life on the high seas. And this is, these are the records of the Marine and General, Gen General Mutual uh, Life Assurance Society a company. Now this was established in, in Worthing in 1852, and it was based in originally, sorry, it was based in London originally, and it moved down to Worthing in 1974. Uh, when MGM House was built. Um, for those of you who know Worthing, it was built on the site of the old Heen Baths. Um, it was the longest registered company in Great Britain with the number six, um, although the company itself was dissolved in 2018. 
Prior to that, the business was transferred to the Scottish Friendly in 2015, and that was when we became involved. And we were asked if we would um, take in and look after um, these archives. So until that date, until 2015, we had no idea that the company existed, much less that the archives did as well. It is um, an extraordinary story. The first meeting was held in Leadenhall Street in London in 1852 in the offices of the Peninsula and Oriental Steam Navigation Company, what later became P&O. And the attendees indeed were um, men from prominent maritime organizations of their day, including the East India Company, uh, the P&O, and they were joined by ship owners such as Samuel Cunard. And the first prospectus, uh, which was published, said it, they were offering advantages to the seafaring portion of the community, which no office has yet attempted. So this company were ensuring the lives of sailors and mariners who traveled all over the world. And they, the archives uh, reflect some of those stories. During the, first, the end of the first year, uh, they had over a thousand seamen on their books. And the survival of the archive itself is remarkably complete. It survived the bombing in London uh, during the Second World War, and it equally survived the, the move to Worthing in 1974. Uh, and very often you find with business records that if a company moved around, um, the records, that the, the survival of the records is patchy because they, take with, they took with them what they needed um, for the company to keep going, but not necessarily the older material. But in this case, they kept it all and they took it with us. And it's now in the West Sussex Record Office. It includes company records and minutes, accounts, ledgers, policies and claims, valuations, deeds, staffing records, all the usual things that you would expect to find um, in a business records, including the designs for the coat of arms that you can see on the right. Um, and they have a, a, a dragon representing, the, a Chinese dragon and a seahorse representing the power of the sea. Now these records show that that life on board ship in the 19th century was um, a very dangerous occupation. Uh, and the, the life, the mortality of sailors was, was, was calculated at 50% higher than, than that for those who worked on land. But I think these records give a fascinating insight into the sailors themselves, but also into uh, the challenges and the dangers that they faced, the different roles that were needed um, on board um, these ships in the 19th century. And if we can, I'm going to take you through uh, the ledger for uh, showing the lives that were assured and the lives claimed, the claims that were made in 1855. You can see there on the left-hand column, the names of the, of the sailors and the people on board ship and a description of um, their their trades, their professions. Um, so at the top there, you've got a steward and an engineer and a um, lieutenant. And then further down, you have an engineer, a fireman, stewards, um, a storekeeper. And uh, if we play the, you'll be able to see, they give the dates of their death. I'm just going to pause it there because it gives you the, the cause of death as well. So we have consumption, we have diphtheria, paralysis, um, death by drowning, apoplexy. Um, and we even had have Thomas Eason there who died when a paddle wheel float fell on his head. Now that was in Southampton, but if you look at the places of death uh, on the right-hand column, uh, somewhere in Hong Kong, uh, in Bombay, on the Black Sea, the Baltic Sea, uh, and right at the top there, Balaclava. And this next slide actually shows a full, full view of that page. So you not only get the claims for 1855, but you can see those there for 1856 as well. Um, and it's interesting to see the amount that their, their lives were insured for. So uh, at the top, you've got the, uh, the lieutenant and the, the chief engineer and the steward whose lives are 
insured at th payouts at 300 and 200 pounds. And then as you go down, um, the firemen at 20 pounds uh, and the butcher at the beginning of 19, 1856, uh, he similarly, uh, he died of typhus fever uh, whilst at sea and his, the claim for his life was 20 pounds. So I think you wouldn't expect in the West Sussex Record Office in Chichester to come across a record that, that tells you about the life of people um, on the South China Seas, on the Black Sea, uh, and the mortality rates and, and the challenges that they faced, uh, and this insight into 19th century shipping. And I want to finish off this evening, and I couldn't not include this really, uh, because it is one of the most extraordinary stories, um, certainly since I've been county archivist at the West Sussex Record Office. And this is the Sussex Declaration. Now, when you look at this document, you can see that it was originally folded up and it would have looked much like any other 18th, 19th century deed that come in with solicitor's records or are stored in basements. But when you start to read it, it tells a very different story. And the more, most recent story really began in 2015. And Harvard University set up their Declaration Resources Project. And as part of the project, they wanted to find all the extant copies, the known copies of the Declaration, the American Declaration of Independence and to create a database of these. And you can see uh, on the photograph, the two Harvard scholars um, who came over to the record office and who we've been working with ever since. On the right is Danielle Allen, who's the James Bryant Conant University um, professor. She's also, um, she was the principal investigator of the Declaration Resources Project. And on the left is Emily Sneff, um, who is now a doctoral student at the College of William and Mary, um, but she was a research manager for the Declaration Resources Project. And this project really aimed to create scholarly resources to support teaching and learning about the Declaration um, and to equip people with information so that they could engage with the text and the context of the Declaration in new ways. So that was, that was where the project uh, started. And as they were scouring uh, databases and collections all over the world, um, they found amongst our online catalog an entry for our copy of the declaration. Now we knew we had it. Um, it was published in um, Kim Leslie's book, Roots of America in 1976. But I think what we didn't appreciate and indeed what nobody knew was the significance of this document until Harvard came visiting in August 2016. And then the story erupted uh, because the um, discoveries around it uh, were quite extraordinary. And it soon became apparent that we had a very rare document uh, amongst our collections. And it was a story that spread round, quickly spread around the world. I remember the break, it breaking um, the news breaking uh, on the um, over the weekend of, of the West Sussex Archive Society AGM, um, and on Monday morning by eight o'clock, uh, we had CVS and a, a huge broadcast um, van outside, parked outside the record office, with cables feeding through the search room windows, uh, and they wanted to record the story and feed it with live feed to hit the east coast for the main time, prime time news slot at nine o'clock in the morning. It's fair to say it's had its, its, its fair share of international interest since then uh, with royal and um, political and presidential interest. But I think as the story started to break and as we looked at it in more detail, it, it raised really more questions than answers. And there was a question of when was it made, why, who made it, where, and how did it end up in the West Sussex Record Office? And the initial findings um, 
were delivered by Danielle in a paper at Yale in, in April 2017, when she put forward um, a series of hypotheses uh, about to, trying to answer some of those questions. Uh, a De Sussex Declaration project was then set up with the British Library, with the Library of Congress, um, Harvard and ourselves, to, do, um, to enable more work to be carried out on that, on that um, document. And we spent um, two days in the British Library in August 2017, where um, tests were carried out, multispectral multi imaging, X-ray fluorescence capture, uh, and uh, DNA testing was also done as part of some of those um, investigations. And you can see there the photographs of the, uh, some of the imaging taking place. And these are the uh, areas really of the, the document that we were particularly interested to find out more about. There was obviously some damage along the sides of the document on either side. We could see that in the text, there had been corrections made uh, and there were areas where um, there would been some damage in the middle. And equally at the top of the document, we could see that something had been going on underneath that main heading. Uh, and rather than, there was a limit to what we could see with the naked eye. And so we tried to look at that in more detail. And if I just play this, um, you can see there at the top, um, if we can zoom in a bit closer, and you can see that there is something there underneath, um, underneath the main heading. If I play it a bit further, Here we go. Uh, you can see the names at the bottom. Um, if we can zoom out a bit, that's better. And then we can see some of the names, John Hancock, Benjamin Franklin, John Adams, very familiar names. The thing to notice there is that those have all been written by the, the clerk who wrote the main document. So they're not the signatures of the individual, um, individual people. And the damage that I was talking about uh, on those corners there, if I stop that there then, um, you can see that when it's folded up, um, there are mirror images of those so that the damage took place when the document was folded up. Uh, and we think it was either caused by, by rodents um, or possibly by some kind of clasp being put in place. But having seen quite a number of documents in my time um, with rodent damage, I have to say that does look like rodent damage to me, but we shall see. In my mind, I can see the teeth marks. Let's, let's, let's uh, leave it at that. Right, so the multispectral imaging uh, involved looking at the document using under different lights through, through the spectrum. And what you can see there, I think, is some of the imaging coming out from underneath that main heading. And we were able to see that underneath that uh, was a date that was reading either July 4th, and then we can see a 1, 7, and either an 8 or a 9, but it's impossible to say uh, what the fourth digit is or was. Um, but it's, it, you can certainly see things more clearly um, under the, those different images. And the conclusions were, that were reached um, by the end of 2018 was that this is, was indeed one of um, only two known ceremonial parchment manuscript copies, the other being the, what's known as the Matlack Declaration uh, in the archives at, in Washington, which I went to see in 2019. Um, Ours is the same size as this, but it's um, landscape rather than portrait. Uh, and the other difference is, of course, that the Matlack has the signatures and, and ours doesn't. There were a lot of copies that were actually printed and circulated, but nothing on this scale. So when you declare independence, you want people to know about it and you print out copies so they can be distributed. So all the other comp copies are printed or they're much, they're much smaller. And we think that um, 
the, certainly the, the confirmation of the dating to, seven, to the 1780s is, is, has been confirmed by the tests. The analysis of the ink shown that it was all written at one time, even the corrections. And there are pinholes uh, along, the sides, along the sides of the document that show that at some point it was hung up. It was made of sheepskin rather than calfskin. Uh, it's thought to have been held by the third Duke of Richmond, who was named as the Radical Duke for his support of the Americans during the revolution. Uh, and the theory is it was drawn up in America, possibly in New York or Philadelphia, and possibly commissioned by James Wilson as part of his work on the Constitution. So how did it come to us? Well, it was given to the record office in 1956 by this gentleman on the top here called Leslie Holden. And I think it's fair to say that we owe him a great deal. Uh, it was one of a series of deposits that he made during his lifetime. And in fact, we've got about 60 different deposits from him over the years. In 1956, Francis Steer was the county archivist and you can see him there, bottom left. And Leslie Holden um, worked for a firm of solicitors called Rapers in Chichester. And they were the uh, solicitors for um, the Dukes of Richmond for a considerable period of time. So the theory is that the, the declaration came across with the third duke, became part of the third duke's papers, and eventually ended up with rapers with the solicitors, um, and that Leslie Holden um, brought that into the record office. He, he worked as a clerk there for very many years, and he was responsible for rescuing a large number of documents from the war salvage effort uh, during the Second World War. And I'd like to finish off by just reading a bit from some of his diaries. His daughter very kindly gave us access to his diaries during the project, and they throw a fascinating light on the um, life in Chichester, uh, on the people and the activities, and immediately to sort of take you back into Chichester in the 1950s. But I've got, reading a page here, he says that um, very soon after arriving at Rapers in 1942, um, he was instructed that he heard that um, the office boy, Roy Gardner, had been instructed to empty numerous old deed boxes in the strong room deposit and deposit its contents in the cellar for collection by the war salvage people to assist with the war effort. The partner asked in question asked uh, Leslie Holden to check on the quantity of the material available for collection. And he says, I descended in the cellar one evening after work and completely astounded, I was completely astounded by what I discovered. There was a large volume of material of all kinds. I found two large parchment deeds, both bearing the great seal of, Elizabeth, of England, one Elizabethan and another Henry VIII. It was quite impossible to do a thorough and meticulous search in a cellar lit by a single bulb in the area where the material had been tipped, plus the fact that there was considerable dust from the office coal stored in another part of the huge cellar, which ran beneath the ground floor of the office. And there that really paints a picture, I think, for you of what Leslie discovered. The following day, he reported back to the partner and he said that he thought the material should be kept, that it shouldn't be destroyed and that there was a lot of really interesting historical material there. And the partner agreed that um, in his spare time, Leslie could search through the, that material, which indeed he did. And he says, my plan was to involve two of the most capable people living in Chichester at that time, Walter Peckham, an antiquarian of Ryman's Appledram Lane, and a Dr. Hilda Johnson of St. Martin's Square. Now, Peckham was a, a client of, of Rapers, um, and he says of Hilda Johnson that he'd come to know her well and she was extremely interested in the material he says, I was in the habit of visiting her quite regularly, and she referred to, my, to herself as my historical aunt, which is rather nice. Um, and so he set about retrieving this, this material and taking it to, uh, to, to Walter Peckham and to Hilda Johnson to look at. So he said, I would visit Mr. Peckham at Ryman's from time to time, taking with me the material for him to make decisions on. If my visits were in the evening, I was ex not expected before 8 p.m. or later, and during the winter months, a wood fire would be blazing and giving out a great deal of heat. So you can, again, you can see this picture of, of them sitting around the fire and looking through the material. 
I think the most exciting and rewarding visit was when I took a number of documents and he pounced on one in particular, which was the statutes of the Bishop Sherborne of the Vicar's Choral of Chichester Cathedral. These, he almost shouted, he had a particularly loud voice and was quite deaf, have been missing for years. The remainder of that visit was occasionally, was, was occupied by these. And he, he said um, that Peckham would, would, would be talking about them nonstop, virtually nonstop. And be, he became aware of the time and the fire was reduced to ashes. And we would part company at any time between one and two o'clock in the morning. So I think that that paints a picture of, of some of the material that, that Leslie brought in. Um, and he continued to, to rescue this material um, and he would take them to his friends to, to look at and to, to appraise. Um, and all of this took place before the record office was set up. Um, so latterly, once the record office was set up, then he started to bring the material into us. So although we've got no proof that the Sussex Declaration was actually amongst these documents, there is, you know, a likelihood that it was. Um, and he, I think, is quite extraordinary in, in the work that he did. And his diaries really paint a picture from that time. And I want to leave you just with one final extract from his diaries. Um, and I refer now to... Um, to the first county archivist, whose picture you can see on the right, who was uh, Bernard Campbell Cook. And um, he, he talks about a Mr. Uh, a Meller, who um, was involved, uh, a client of the firm's, uh, and who had um, sheds in St. Martin's Lane, and who also um, collected various documents. And Meller died in St. Richard's Hospital, and as part of his wartime work, um, Leslie Holden, was working in the men's ward of the hospital and he remembers attending Mr. Meller uh, only a few days before his death. And he talks about uh, Campbell Cook becoming appointed as archivist. He says it was a new and much needed appointment. And one of his earliest tasks was to arrange the collection of all the materials stored on the damaged Meller sheds off St. Martin's Lanes, because these sheds have been hit during the war. And he says, Bernard Campbell Cook, whom I alerted concerning these documents, spent the whole day with a hand cart and the help of an assistant from County Hall trailing back and forth between St. Martin's and the record office with all the damaged and a quantity of undamaged deeds and documents. And I love that image of, of the first county archivist with a wooden hand cart going backwards and forwards along the streets of Chichester um, collecting archives. And the result, as a result of Leslie Holden's work and others like them, uh, we're now working on the Transatlantic Ties Project. We had a grant of $100,000 from the Mellon Foundation to um, do more research between the connections uh, between West Sussex and the United States, which are fascinating. Um, and we are going to create a new website and put digital resources up there. And we'll have an international symposium in, 19, in 2022 to bring all the research um, together. And we're also looking to see how these, the declaration can be a part of the 250th anniversary um, in 2026. Um, and I've also put at the end of the slides here um, a series of the things I've been talking about. So there are links there that you can find to, um, to the various um, items, documents um, and projects that I've talked about, including the Harvard research resources there. This talk is going to go up on our new YouTube channel at the end of the week. So if you want to have a look at it again, you can do. Uh, I hope you've enjoyed this evening. If you've got more questions, please put them on the chat and I will answer them uh, in, a, in a second. I'm going to ask um, Claire to, um, I'm going to stop sharing my screen and ask Claire to put up a, a very short poll, which I'd be very grateful if you could um, complete for us. As I say, this is a new venture for us. Uh, we have um, talks going out now until November, um, and if you go onto our, our website, you'll be able to see the, the details of those. Uh, we've got Shippham's at the end of August. We've got Queen Victoria Hospital at the end of September. Uh, at the end of October, we've got Martin Hayes talking about the photographic archives of Worthing. And at the end of November, Joe McConville, our Transatlantic Ties project officer, will be talking about um, the 
the American Research and the Transatlantic Ties Project. Um, so I'm going to stop sharing my screen. Oh, there we go. Claire's managed to put it up. So if you can um, fill that in, I'd be very grateful for you. And I will actually now go to the chat box. And while I'm answering questions, perhaps you can, um, perhaps you can uh, fill in that that um, very short uh, feedback form. It's a new venture for us. We very much want to make sure that we get it right. So, so do help us with that. Um, the Marine and General Mutual Insurance Collection um, as yet um, is uncatalogued, uh, but if you'd like to email in to us, we can give you further details of that. So that was a, a, one of the first collections. So if you email into the record office inbox, we'll be able to send you more details of that. Um, Chittis University, yes, has its own archive um, and we do work with them. And Chittis University are in fact, one of the partners in our Transatlantic Ties project. Uh, so, uh, and, and uh, have been involved with other projects. They were involved with the Vaudry project as well. Um, somebody is asking about public schools in West Sussex. We do, we do have links with some public schools um, but we'd be very keen to work with more and we're always keen for, for, um, for schools to get in touch with them and we try to, to, to reach out to as many schools as possible. Um, and yes, we will be making future talks available online. Thank you for that. Um, as I say, if you go onto our, onto our website, you'll be able to, to see the programme that we've got coming up for you. And that does include actually a new uh, West Sussex Unwrapped live event in September. Uh, our West Sussex uh, Unwrapped live um, comes to an end, the second series in September, going out with a bang with a live event, and it's going to be on Sussex Cinema, uh, when uh, I will be introducing that session, and Frank Gray, the director of Screen Archive Southeast, will be talking about the history of Sussex cin Cinema and showing some of the films. So I'd like to thank you all very much for being with me tonight. Um, it's not often that I get to delve into uh, to the archives and to share them with everybody. And I've, I've so much enjoyed doing it. And I very much hope that you have too uh, and that you will join us for, for other future editions. So thank you and, and good night. <laughs>